Hello, my name is Baptiste Brieux and I work for Index in Europe and today I will do a, a brief introduction on what kind of errors you can find with survey data. Sometimes we refer to downhaul surveys being used only at the exploration stage, um, but actually the value of the surveys are uh, throughout the entire cycle of the mining. Right? We don't just talk about serving a tool to uh, measure a sample, but it's also used for uh, mine planning, geotechnical purposes, and further down with drill and blast as well. So three whole power survey are considered as one of the most critical uh, data sets in, um, in mineral exploration and, and mining production. Uh, so it acts actually as a, as a foundation for subsequent downhole data such as uh, logging and, and assays. So um, traditionally we use the downhole surveys for, for geological and geotechnical modeling but we can also use it for making sure we are staying on track with the drilling. And if we need to make a decision to maybe steer that hole, we will also use the survey tools to actually uh, give a new a dip and a new azimuth to, um, to, the, to the drilling. And in some occasion, we will use that tool for collision avoidance purposes. Uh, so that if we don't need to, uh, to get into a specific area, we can use the tools to make sure that we are staying away from a fault or from an infrastructure that we don't want to hit with, with the drilling. Um, the consequence of not having good data could be quite catastrophic in terms of uh, financial, but it's also a safety aspect to it, which is very important. So to have complete data uh, to build that downhole survey, we need a set of uh, XYZ coordinates, uh, which are the color coordinates, and then we need a, a depth, a dip, and an azimuth. Uh, based on that data, we can actually build a survey. There's sometimes the assumption that we are drilling straight holes. Uh, sadly, that rarely happens. Deviation happens. It's not always controllable, so um, we have to deal with that, and that's the reason why we do the surveys. And when we talk about errors, usually we, uh, we refer to the accuracy of a tool or, or to the setup, but it's a combination and an accumulation of errors which makes those um, potential large and great errors which can compromise uh, a project. So the, one of the first common mistakes we find is to do with uh, geospatial uh, conversions and calculations. Uh, there is sometimes a, a, a lack of understanding on, um, on those calculations. And when we talk about geospatial data, it means it's reference to a, um, a projected coordinate system. And that coordinate system will either be a common grid system or a non-grid system like the WGS84, but it could also be in some operation uh, a local or a mine grid system as we call it, which is very specific to that project only. So when we talk about grid, we obviously have um, a, a different type of north. So we, uh, we find the true north, the grid north and the magnetic north, and how to convert those azimuth uh, to get to the correct uh, grid north is a, a source of errors in the, uh, in the QAQC process of uh, survey data. Something to remember is that true north and magnetic north are a known uh, location in space where grid north is just a direction. So that's something quite important to remember. Right, so if we uh, just have a look at uh, magnetic north for a start. So magnetic north, as we knew earlier, it's a known location but um, its location is moving with time. Uh, so we can see here uh, the location of, of uh, Magnetic North uh, in 1900 and where is it today? It's moving quite significantly, so that's something you need to consider when you are using a Magnetic Tools, which is using a reference of Magnetic North. To make those conversions, uh, we use uh, an angle called the declination. The declination is basically the difference between Magnetic North and True North. And again, that declination will vary depending where you are based in the world and it will also vary with the time. So the declination will be different uh, three years ago than it is today. And um, finally we can see also that there is um, some variation due to the magnetic activity. Um, so here on that graph we can see the, the declination with the time and um, in, in one single day you could have a variation of 0.2 degrees just because of the uh, high magnetic activity in the area. 
the other ones, so Green North and True North, so these two are quite um, generally a source of error because they are quite confused. Some people will think it's the same, some people will think they can assume that Green North is the same as True North. And uh, this is generally a problem in some uh, small and medium sized projects. Um, quite important, there is no survey tool out there which can be referenced directly to Green North. Um, the only north we can reference at all is a magnetic north or magnetic tool and true north or a true north seeking gyro. But to come back to a grid north we have to apply some conversions. And to apply those conversions we use um, what we call the convergence value which is to correct the true north and the green magnetic angle to correct from magnetic north. So if we are assuming that uh, those convergence values can be ignored depending on the, on, on the difference and that could have a massive impact on the positional uh, error of the survey. Um, here is um, typically that's a WGS grid system. So if we take, if we zoom in in one zone, that's basically how it looks like. So the convergence value is negligible when you are located at the equator or are the meridian of the zone, so at the center of the zone. But as soon as you are deviating east or west, uh, so if we take the example, uh, let's say we are in Nevada, at 30, 36 degree latitude, if you are located really far from the meridian, you could have an error up to 1.7 degrees, which is quite critical with, um, with the type of data we are dealing with. So that's something that uh, is, we need to educate people about those different north because that's uh, a very, a large source of error. So in terms of technology we use to, um, to build a survey, there's three parts of it really. So the first one, which is knowing with very high accuracy the location of your caller. So that's what we call the caller XYZ coordinates. And for that we will use typically a GNSS rover at the surface or a laser station uh, underground. Then the rig comes in, we start uh, to start drilling. Uh, we would use uh, typically a rig aligner to align the rig to the correct dip and the correct azimuth um, to, uh, to start drilling with the correct uh, parameters. And then we bring a down hole survey once we started to uh, drill and that will help us to collect the depth data, dip and azimuth. So once we've got all that, we can actually have some survey data. So when we talk about the, the rig alignment and the impact of starting to drill at the right, at the right dip and the right azimuth, um, it, it's something which is really, really important to educate the, the market about, uh, about that because the errors can be very, very significant. So if we focus on a dip only for now, uh, and a one degree dip error on the alignment, that will result at 1,000 meter, roughly around 20 meters inaccuracy, so that's quite significant. We haven't started to drill yet, but we're already 20 meters out. So <laughs> is there any point actually to start drilling in that case? With the azimuth, however, it's slightly different. The azimuth error will depend on the inclination of the drill string. So for a very low inclination near vertical, the impact of the azimuth won't be as major. But if we are thinking about an application where the rigs are working underground, horizontal setup, then the error will be again very significant. Same as a dip, we'll have roughly about 20 meters. So it's very critical to align that rig machine as well as possible. Something that not everybody knows, but w when we start drilling, we, um, we go through the overburden, uh, we put a casing in place, and it occasionally happens that the rig will shift a little bit, and therefore the dip and the azimuth won't be the same. It's some, sometimes negligible, but sometimes it's not, and it's, it's worth to redo a survey just to check those details. So, although the rig aligner is a preferred solution for that type of surveys, we find some other type of uh, methods or technology to collect the starting dip and the starting end of it. One of the first ones we find is uh, using a geological compass, so that's fine just to align roughly a rig, but it's nowhere near the accuracy of of the rig aligner and also because it's magnetic um, it's, very, it's clearly not the best practice to use that near, near the drill rig. Um, we also see some uh, Genesis receivers so that's using satellites uh, so the only problem with those solutions it's only working at the surface 
because it relies on the satellite coverage. And depending on the weather, the time of day, um, where you are located, um, it, it could be the accuracy could vary uh, quite substantially. Then finally, we can see some places where they use uh, a north seeking gyro to align a rig. So the problem with that is um, some data, you, you might get a live data, you might not get a live data, but more importantly, the, the, the MEMS gyros are quite limited with the inclination and also where you are located, in a, how far north you are located in the world, right? So you could easily be one or two degrees out depending on the tool you are using. And for a rig alignment purpose, again, it's not really the best practice. And then, so these three tools that can be operated by the driller or by a geologist, but then we also find ways to, uh, to collect that data using toll stations, so that's uh, commonly done underground. Uh, the problem of toll station, even though the technology is very, very accurate, um, there's no live data provided, so we have to point and shoot, measure, correct, and redo the survey until we find the right position. So that type of equipment can only be used by a professional land surveyor, so that's something that you need to get to the site, you need to get the person to the site to measure those data. So when we are using um, a LIDAR system underground to pick up the color azimuth and a color dip, uh, we usually find uh, that uh, the survey will come and will measure uh, the bearing to the bottom of the rod and the bearing to the top of the rod. Having that data, we can determine the rig starting dip and the rig starting azimuth. The problem with that is it's quite difficult to actually point the laser, the laser straight on the middle of the road. So if you are pointing slightly left at the top and slightly right at the bottom, then you end up with a misalignment. And just a 25 millimeter misalignment will result in 0.5 degree error. So even though the technology is really, really accurate, um, we can still find some errors uh, using that technology. And the rig aligner again will be clearly the best practice for that. And sometimes we even find that the survey will take a shot to the casing, the casing be having a much greater diameter than the rod that will induce more error. So this is, these are the reasons why the rig aligner is really the best practice for aligning rigs. Whether you are located at the surface or on the ground, there's no limitation to it. It's a state-of-the-art system. It's used in military purpose, in space application, and uh, it never disappoints. And the beauty of it is you don't need to get uh, a geologist or a surveyor to come and confirm the rig alignment. It's a tool which is operated by the drillers, really simple, and they can start drilling straight away after the rig is aligned. Yeah, we have a, a workflow in place, so that can be done remote. They have the advantage, of course, and inconvenience, but if we focus on the magnetic here, uh, at Index we do have the, the easy track. The real issue with the magnetic tools is they are affected by magnetic uh, environment. So if you are drilling into uh, a, a geology which is magnetic, then your survey data will be compromised and therefore it cannot be used. But there are other inconvenience using a, a magnetic tool as opposed to a, a gyroscope. Um, you can't survey while retrieving core. Um, it's not able to look for the starting dip and azimuth because it's affected by the magnetic. And it's only a, a single or multi-shot uh, tool, so it can be very time-consuming to build a survey. Or and in terms of positional error, uh, it, it could be uh, it could be affected. When we look at a gyroscope, uh, we have two types of gyros: uh, what we call the true north-seeking gyros and also the reference gyros. So, the, in essence, one of the only difference between both is the true north-seeking gyro will calculate its own starting azimuth and then we'll run continuously uh, towards the bottom of the hole, uh, same as the, the reference tool. For the reference tool, however, you'll have to put a starting azimuth before you start the survey. And we know that the starting azimuth is something which is very, very critical for that data. So when we look at the potential errors we can find, they are you know, three layers. So before the survey, you could have a wrong XYZ coordinates for the hole color, and also a wrong starting azimuth, which can induce error. During the survey, there's uh, quite a lot of things which can happen from not entering the correct drill hole information, not selecting the correct tool for the correct application, um, having a tool which is probably not fit for the job, uh, probably maybe not calibrated, not using the correct running gear or the centralizers. And then, of course, we've got the survey execution where 
you know, lack of training with uh, the operator, not uh, having the experience to run tools. And um, again, uh, due to the running gear, uh, sometimes we can find some errors um, with the service. And then we got a post-survey part of it, so we, <laughs> we found a few times when uh, the data is exported into a USB drive stick and then the USB drive stick is gone, uh, is gone lost. Um, we lose, suddenly we lost the survey data. Um, we then have to deal with all the geospatial calculation, converting a magnetic tool uh, data into grid north or a true north stick into the grid north. And then not paying enough attention to the QAQC of that survey data. So even though sometimes the error is negligible or very small, the accumulation of errors can be the problem here. So you see, IMDEX, we're trying to tackle these challenges by having uh, a few systems in place. So of course, we have the hardware. We are very well known with our Devico Devijaro and the IMDEX Omni X38 and the Sprint IQ. But that data collected then goes straight into a cloud-based system called IMDEX Hub. And this is where we can have a control on a QAQC uh, the, having a, a, a very good approval workflow that, so that when you are assessing that data and uh, doing all that QAQC, you've got a very high level of confidence that that survey data is exactly how it should be. The data can then be moved across all the software, such as Index, IOGAS, and Acquire, and that can be done just through an API key, so there's no, at no point in time there's any manual import or export to do. It's all done very, very smoothly. Um, and then, of course, IMDEX, we've got a, a very large team of, uh, of technical salespeople who can travel to sites, educate the geologists, educate the drillers, train the drillers on how to use the tool, give the best practice, and this is something we are very proud of. Uh, that's what made IMDEX today. Um, and then, of course, we, we have a range of uh, solutions, not just across a JARO survey, but we can integrate our data with uh, all uh, sort of uh, technologies such as uh, the structure logging technology uh, and other type of technology. Right, I hope that was, that gave you a very, very brief introduction on what type of errors you could find with surveys and how we can potentially overcome those issues by using the index solutions. Thank you.